Maybe we should uh, just give each of the presenters a minute or two just to respond to some of uh, John's comments, and then we'll take questions from the floor. Uh, Nina, will, will you start? It's on, yeah. Uh, thank you, John, and I think you had a very uh, challenging task of uh, trying to <laughs> connect uh, three, as you said, very different presentations, and I think you did extremely well trying to pull out some of the points that I should have emphasized more, perhaps, as well. Um, so just to... Uh, I agree that the characteristics of, uh, of the firm owners or the characteristics of the firms in general is something that I didn't bring out due to time constraints. Uh, and I think, uh, indeed, there's something there in, in terms of uh, how labor relations play out, or in this case, uh, unionization. Uh, and as you hinted at, it is indeed the case that female-owned firms are more likely to have workers that are unionized. As we also know from the literature, that female-owned firms tend to be more generous in terms of provisions of uh, social security and so on. Uh, so there is a, and it's in the paper actually, but I didn't uh, sort of uh, highlight that bit. Um, uh, so also in terms of the, the kinds of uh, companies, uh, we see that uh, limited uh, liability companies and actually also this, uh, in the survey we have a bundle of uh, collectives, uh, sort of uh, enterprises, um, and they are also positively correlated with uh, union membership. Um, of course, state-owned enterprises. Uh, I didn't talk so much about them because they're not actually part of the, the sample, but their union membership is, is very high, but uh, that is, is, is changing a lot uh, with what's going on in Vietnam. Uh, so yeah, indeed, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's important for the analysis to actually go more into depth to see what are the correlations within the, the firm uh, because they vary a lot uh, and how they are uh, set up. So that was my short answer to that. Um, I wanted to pick up on one point that you were talking about is the link um, to Nina's paper and, and this on, on labor markets and regulations. I think there are many aspects to this. I mean, the one is that um, South Africa is a high wage economy and in a way it will be for a while because of various structural features. Very high dependency ratio given the very high unemployment means that the reservation wages of workers are relatively high as well. Secondly, their location is generally, given South Africa's history of, of, of development and, and where to locate, where people were located, the transport costs and access to the workplaces tend to be very high as well. These impose quite high um, impediments to lowering wages. But your point about the extent to which then labor legislation compounds some of those factors, I think is a very interesting one and an important one. And there are a number of dimensions. So South Africa, as we know, it has a collective bargaining um, system, but it also has wage extension. So very different from Vietnam, whereas the wage agreed by the unions in the collective bargaining process is then extended to non-participants that are not participating in the bargaining. And the one argument is if we look at these bargaining councils, who do they comprise of? They comprise of relatively large capital intensive, efficient firms. And if you look at the, one of the arguments that these firms make about not extending the wage agreements, one of the key arguments they make is that those firms, out if they don't apply the wages, they outcompete it. So to some extent, it seems that those, nego those bargaining councils become a forum of, to exclude more efficient, or, or rather exclude smaller, low wage industries or firms from entering into the particular market. So there's a, an important, there's an interest, that, and that's an argument that has been made, um, Nicolae Natchez and so on, for example, argued. And that in a way I think talks to a big issue um, about why we don't see firms and manufacturing firms entering into manufacturing, because to some extent the institutional, the system is biased against them. They can't enter on the basis of low wages and small size, um, so they don't enter. I think compounding that, uh, linking that is also, it's not only the labor market, and maybe this, the, we also should look at the market structure, and maybe this is an outcome related to this story as well, is what we, from the firm data itself, it seems that South African industries are very concentrated in manufacturing as well. So we have high levels of concentration. So it suggests that there are also barriers from the, you know, the market structure, from the output side, there are, there are some barriers to entry of smaller um, firms as well. So, on top of that, I'm going to add in the third capacity constraint is we have a big government. So we have a big unions, we've got big firms. 
And then we've got big government. And big government controls fixed line telecommunication, rail transportation, ports, and airline. So they control some of the key non-traded input costs that are critical to make South African exporters competitive. And so when we look at some of the data, what we see is the structure of pricing, for example, on transports are that the price for um, um, bulk goods tends to be low, the price for uh, manufactured goods is high, or containers. Same with ports. The price of containers is, is, is three times the world average. The price of uh, port charges for bulk goods tends to be, on average, competitive with the international market. So to some extent, actually, big government itself is, uh, is, is adding to some of these non-traded input costs, in addition just to the non-traded labor costs um, as well. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, Jerusalem didn't have a, a comment to John, but I have a question for Jerusalem before I open the floor, uh, because I did some work myself on uh, the barriers to access to credit uh, divided by gender. And basically, we found a very, very surprising result that existing firms in Africa, uh, we cannot find discrimination against women in terms of access to credit. We cannot find discrimination against women uh, in terms of access to management consulting. And we also found other issues where we cannot find significant differences between male and female-owned firms. So my question is, um, those women that are able to break the glass ceiling to actually become enterprise owners uh, are maybe not the problem. So a lot of the slides you showed were existing firms. I'm, I'm more concerned about women being able to become entrepreneurs to actually being able to open a business because the women that are able to open a business today, they are actually very, very strong, maybe even more productive than some of the males and more skilled because otherwise they wouldn't be able to break the glass ceiling. So my question is, the, the figures you had, uh, are they relevant for the discussion about gender biases? Okay. I actually had one slide on access to credit, which is showing that uh, women seem to have higher access to uh, credit, uh, while at the same time they report that they have a binding constraint on um, on getting credit. Uh, but you would have to give me on uh, some context of which African country that you have studied on uh, in terms of breaking into the glass ceiling. Uh, basically, my thinking on this support for entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, is to look at the exit uh, exit of women, be it from entrepreneurship or the productive labor market, and think that what can we invest on to avoid women's uh, exit from uh, the formal setting, uh, labor market or uh, business entry. Um, so those who have made it into, uh, in terms of breaking the glass ceiling, maybe they are, um, some. they do have some characteristic uh, to excel in this environment regardless of uh, uh, um, not discrimination, but some differential di difficulty of in, uh, getting access to credit or uh, access to uh, management consulting that you mentioned. But uh, I, I would have to try really hard at that. There, your like, result on uh, no differential access to <laughs> many of the uh, uh, key business inputs in Africa. It seems that many people are uh, flagging against that. Um, but um, I mean, I, I really want to engage also the audience in terms of how we can avoid the women's exit uh, uh, from this uh, labor market or entrepreneurship. What are the uh, like the institutions or what should be in place on the ground to avoid uh, be it uh, exit or also to encourage uh, entry of uh, more uh, a lot more women entrepreneurs. Uh, thank you very much to all the presenters. Um, my name is Paddy Carter. I'm from the British uh, Development Finance Institution, CDC, and uh, we are hugely interested in anything which is um, both good for welfare and good for the um, financial performance of firms because we want to send our ENS teams into our investigators and persuade them to adopt these practices. So uh, anything that uh, 
this is a bit of a sales pitch. Anybody that's got any um, research or ideas about uh, evidence around decent work making your firm more of a friendly environment for women and how that affects financial performance, we're terrifically interested in that. So uh, in exchange for that sales pitch, I'm going to trade one simple question, which is to Nino, which is, do you have data on um, firm profits in your data set? And could you see whether those uh, higher wages are translated to lower profits? George. George, um, University of Ghana. Um, on Jerusalem's uh, question about uh, entry or why there are barriers to women entry, I mean, I I did some work for Danida in northern Ghana, where there are, there are the witches camp, and women that excel and become rich tend to be considered as witches. Or if someone died mysteriously then you were considered a witch, so you were moved. So societal norms and, f and family structure or family-based issues. And, and that's one of the things I was going to ask maybe John Page, and I have the time now, from the earlier parallel session 1.1 and the other one. The key thing is, what is the role of the family? Because qualitative data that some of my colleagues in the business school have done show that Women start the enterprises whilst their husbands are in formal employment. And as the business grows and becomes profitable, the women become more of operations managers and then the men take over. So you, you are finding some switching in, in, in there. So how are the family dynamics? And that may be a question broadly to all of us in here. Because why aren't African enterprises growing, for instance? You have families where they start businesses, and when the first generation is exiting, there is a fight. So the business never transitions to that next stage. So maybe that family conditions or societal norms may be also playing out. So maybe, I don't know if you have some comments, but that would be my answer to you, Rosalind. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Knut Holmstad from uh, the Norwegian age, uh, aid agency in uh, Norad. Um, I used to work for the trade union, so uh, this was really nice to, uh, to listen to about uh, the big differences when it comes to, the, uh, <coughs> to uh, union activity. But where I come from, um, uh, the, the wages are mainly set through collective uh, negotiations in the export uh, export uh, sector and uh, and the unions and the government enforce the same wages across the economy and then you have a very high level of uh, of uh, coordination and that is probably necessary when you have strong unions without the, the, they they will uh, be too strong to and to promote the the interests uh, at uh, their lo their local and sectoral interests uh, but I have a, a question uh, regarding South uh, Africa. Uh, it has been a decline in savings in South Africa, both in the private sector and in the government. And also there, there are problems in the, in the electricity sector with the big deficits and load shedding. Uh, what kind of consequences do these uh, things have on, on the industry in, in the country? And we will take actually two more and then we will finish. Uh, Yes. Okay, so thank you, thank you to the three presenters and the discussant. Uh, interesting conversations. So I have two sort of uh, uh, short uh, questions. So the first, uh, uh, Lawrence. Um, so you mentioned that uh, um, uh, when you look at the variety of imports, uh, you find that uh, imports uh, from more advanced economies tend to have a greater or larger productivity impacts. But I'm, I'm sort of just trying to understand whether, how, how do you sort of make the comparisons? Uh, uh, are, they, are these the same firms importing from different uh, types of or sets of countries, or are these different firms importing from different countries? So I just wanted to get a sense. And the second one is, uh, which also sort of struck me, is um, you mentioned that uh, firms that export, so probably I'm not quoting you verbatim, but firms that export uh, to, uh, to sort of more demanding markets are not the same ones exporting, are not actually exporting to the region. And those who are exporting to within the region, they're actually not, uh, their productivity is rather low. 
so, so I'm just curious. I don't know if you have sort of thought about this in terms of, because uh, if if I were, I mean, those firms obviously, if they were to export, maybe they are producing different commodities. But if they were to export in the region, I would think that they would actually do much better, uh, uh, because obviously, I think it's uh, probably the margins exporting to the region. Probably the margins are actually higher than than exporting in very competitive markets. So, so uh, I'm I'm curious as to why they are not actually exporting in the region. Uh, yeah. My name is uh, Shimel Stena. I also come from Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, really thank you very much for your presentation. Now, following the presentation of uh, Professor or Dr. Jerusalem, uh, let me give a very good example about uh, women's entrepreneurship in Tanzania. I have conducted several research studies in Tanzania, and one of it was about uh, women cooperative dairy. Now, these women actually started that as informal groups, first of all. Then, by using the cooperative principles uh, strictly, then they formalized themselves as cooperators, and they formed a cooperative dairy, which is administered and managed by themselves. And uh, when I <coughs> made that study in that area, it reminded of my, my own area uh, in the northwestern part of Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, we have quite many informal types of cooperation uh, uh, in, 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 in several sectors. So women, what are, according to my Observation in the Kalali region in Kilimanjaro area are able actually to start their own entrepreneurship first as informal groups and then formalize them, I mean, formalize entrepreneurship through uh, formal cooperatives. I think this is one important thing that can be learned from that kind of activity, perhaps that can be also transferred in a country like Ethiopia. Thank you very much. Good. Nina, do you mm -hmm. want to respond? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you for the comments. Uh, I'll start responding uh, to your comment, which I th think was the only one actually directly related uh, to my paper. So. Uh, do the higher wages that we see lead to lower profits, right? That was the point. Um, yes, there is uh, data on profits uh, in this uh, survey. Um, and John has worked on that, so maybe he can also uh, add something. But um, in this case, I didn't look uh, specifically at what this means for profits, partly because when sort of lo narrowing down to the number of firms, it's 300 uh, only. In this case, because the focus is the worker, so obviously there wouldn't be so much, uh, you could say, the, the profit uh, if divided or uh, calculated per worker, there would be maybe not, maybe not enough variation to say anything about it. But um, I've done some other work uh, also in the case of Vietnam on uh, larger uh, data sets of firms, uh, where we find that uh, firms that contribute to social security, which is in the case of Vietnam, is linked directly to the wages. Uh, so, so there's some link there. It it doesn't necessarily um, uh, decrease the fact that they start to increase their contributions to social security, uh, health insurance, uh, pensions contributions, and so on. There we don't find lower uh, productivity per worker or profit per worker. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, my 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 response would be I can't say anything about a sort of definite causal effect, but we don't see an association to lower profits. And the kind of uh, reasoning or um, intuition behind it is that these firms are able to attract more qualified workers, uh, more motivated and, and so on, uh, because of their sort of willingness to pay social contributions, indirectly meaning higher wages. And that kind of then links back to this uh, data set um, where we see that actually the firms that tend to have a higher share of union uh, members 
or also the firms with a higher professional share uh, of the workforce. So again, it seems to be that these are firms that are by nature more productive and profitable uh, and therefore not necessarily losing out by, by paying the higher wages. So let me deal with the electricity industry. Um, so in effect, the blackouts or the allocation of electricity have been resolved, um, not through uh, production, but basically as the economy has declined and <laughs> demand for electricity has fallen below capacity. But there are new electricity plants coming online. I think the key issue really is, is about the price. And so what we've seen over the last couple of years is phenomenal increases in prices. So South Africa has moved from an economy which had exceptionally low electricity prices to one in which we have reasonably, I think, I don't know if they're high, but they're sort of average to upper um, electricity prices. And I think that fundamentally does alter our a major source of comparative advantage. So a big story about South Africa's industrial development is the so-called mineral energy complex relationship where excessively, exceptionally low energy prices facilitated the emergence of processing of metal. So our largest manufactured export is, is essentially basic processed basic metals, iron and steel, and, and some of the other non-ferrous metal um, products as well. And that arose off the back of very low electricity prices. So what we're seeing now is with these rising electricity prices that, that these industries are, are taking particular knocks, which has then been compounded by declining global demand for these particular products. So they, I think there's enormous challenges there. So. I think we're going to see big changes in the composition of our exports, but we're also seeing remarkable changes in the efficiency of use of electricity production um, because the prices have, have, have raised. So I think there are um, effects. Um, the just on terms of the um, savings, uh, we have seen declining savings and declining government, uh, and governments playing a role in the savings. There's actually an interesting um, story about uh, that is that we, um, the extent to which this saving drives up the, uh, the value of the real exchange rate. So when you have very, we're having very low private savings, we're having very low savings of a government and, and, and there's, there's, there's no savings. And to, the, what, to what extent does this drive up the, many of the prices, particularly some of the prices of non-traded inputs itself, which then uh, affects the real exchange rate. Because what we've also struggled with is reasonably strong real exchange rate over the period. Some of that's commodity boom um, and so on. But that's not really my area of expertise. But uh, um, the, on the um, productivity, essentially we try different measures. We categorize firms whether they're predominantly a high uh, importer from high income countries or predominantly importer from um, low income countries because what we see is firms tend to import from both. Some only import from some, but in most cases they import from both regions. We then also tried um, the results are presented here. We were just looking at the variation, the, va the varieties from high income um, and then the varieties from um, lowing or other um, countries is an indicator. And effectively, we're looking within firm changes at the time. So we have firm fixed effects. So we ultimately trying to capture the variation and the changes in that relationship over time within a firm and how that correlates with changes in productivity or exports. We don't actually find there's a significant difference between in terms of productivity in, in that relationship. There's some evidence that it may influence, it, it, there's some evidence that um, importing variety from high income, um, rising import variety from high income is associated with stronger export performance, particularly in terms of destinations and products. Um, but in, um, I'm cautious about saying that it's too strong an indicator of technology transfer through that, A, because the measure is very pro it's a proxy for technology transfer, and B, in some cases, the coefficients are not actually significantly different. So I'd say it's more suggestive of, of technology transfer and it's linked to exporting, um, but not productivity. We don't find any significant difference. Thank you for your suggestion first. Um, so two points were raised, one on uh, societal norms in family dynamics. How does that play on uh, enterprise performance? And the other was on cooperatives. Um, so. My thinking is, in terms of uh, addressing the specific needs of women entrepreneurs, is to think, is to think about the question on whether they have a different binding constraint than men. Um, I can point on 
two at least. Well, one I have already discussed on skills. Maybe they have different set of skills. And the other one is on time, time constraint. We don't often um, consider time as input uh, directly, but maybe women have a different set of, uh, like diff that's maybe a, one of the binding constraints when it comes to the nature of the owner of the, the enterprise. And then uh, that's where I would put the family dynamics on, I mean, depending on whether the owner is, I don't know, differently constrained on, uh, on, on time. Um, I do have one study on Ethiopia showing that the share of time uh, entrepreneurs uh, spend on their own enterprise matters for their performance. So maybe the differential impact on business performance comes out of the time, the dif the time constraint they have. Um, as a person overall. Uh, that also uh, reflects on the division of labor at home and uh, uh, whether, uh, whether they have access to formal or informal uh, set of uh, childcare. Uh, thank you for bringing the cooperatives idea in my, uh, uh, so maybe I would speak to you later on, but I am not aware of how the cooperatives, uh, what kind of binding constraint they address. Uh, by women becoming part of these cooperatives, but I can take this one on one later. And I will close it now, even though George had a question. I think you can take that afterwards. Okay. It, uh, <laughs> and uh, because we are over time, one minute. So sorry about that. And hopefully, I'll see a lot of you for the dinner. Thank you.